Hi, my name is Becky Weiser and I'm the curator of the Erie County Historical Society, now known as the Hagen History Center. And I'm standing here in the chapel of beautiful St. Patrick's Church here in Erie to talk a little bit about Erie in 1900. The population at that time was about half of what the city is today, about 53,000 people. And the people that were living here were diverse and it was changing just like the population of Erie is today. Except then it was a little bit different. Prior to the Civil War, the population of the city consisted of people that moved here from the eastern part of the state or from the eastern states and they moved west to what was the frontier and that was Erie. Around the Civil War, other people started coming in and that was mainly the Irish and the Germans. The Irish came and they started this beautiful St. Patrick's Church in about 1853 because the population of the community lived in this area. They also lived around St. Anne's Church on East Avenue. The German population also moved to Erie around the Civil War and churches such as St. Joseph's and St. John's Lutheran, uh, St. Michael's, or all German churches, and that they had services in German and in English, mainly German at that time. It was called the Federal Hill where St. Joe's and St. John's were. The Irish and the Germans assimilated into American culture by the time of the late 1800s. So they were becoming second and third generation, not so much Irish, not so much German, but just Americans. But at that time, there was another influx of immigrants moving here, the Italians and the Poles in great numbers. Other people, of course, too. So the Italian population, what we know today as Little Italy around St. Paul's Church, that was for that community. The Polish population had their own churches and they had many. It started with St. Stan's, which grew into Holy Trinity, there was also St. Hedwig's and St. Casimir's. So we had, again, where you wanted to know where the population of the people were, just look to where the churches were. Also by the late 1800s, the African American community was growing quite a bit in Erie and they were becoming more of a middle class population. Again, the churches reflected where the community was living. So we had Shiloh Baptist, St. James AME Church, also Immaculate Conception Catholic Church was started in the 1940s by African-American um, Catholics. So Erie was becoming very diverse. Now, why are all these people moving here? Well, jobs. By the late 1800s, early 1900s, manufacturing was huge here. And there was a real demand for a populace of people that were willing to work these very difficult, hard jobs, but it was a start for them. And it was something, an opportunity they did not have in the old country. So they came here and they were excited and they worked hard, strong work ethics, and it helped Erie grow. So much so that our population doubled and even more than that towards the end of the 1900s. Here at St. Patrick's was the cathedral in Erie before St. Peter's became a cathedral in the late 1800s, that church was started in 1876. I think by 1890, it became the cathedral. So this church has had a very important and long history as a cathedral, as a church, as a place of beauty and worship here in the Erie community. And we're so thrilled to be here today and to admire the organ and the stained glass and the beautiful statues that they have here. So please enjoy this visit. Hello, I am Mark Alloway, organist and music director at St. Patrick Church here in downtown Erie since 1998. And I would like to share some of the remarkable history of the present St. Patrick Church building. The church we are standing in right now is in fact the third church building. The second was the Pro Cathedral before St. Peter Cathedral was built. The second building was a concrete block building next door to this current church. The church was designed by William Ginther of Akron, Ohio, who was a very prolific architect at the time. 
He designed over 80 churches in this region. The church was excavated in 1902. The cornerstone was laid in June of 1903, and the completed church was dedicated August 2nd, 1906, at a cost of $180,000. The church is insured for $16 million, although it would cost $40 million to replicate it today. The Kali fa Father brothers, there were four of them, were very instrumental in the building of this church and this parish. They were here for 61 years from 1893 to 1954 and their family line continued this parish until 1974 where they were leaders here. They were extremely wealthy from oil discovered on their farmland. Monsignor Peter Colley who was born in Rochester, New York, was from a family of 14 children. After Peter was born, the family moved to Sartwell, Pennsylvania, where his three other brothers were born, and there were several religious sisters from, from the family also. The four Colley brothers became priests, and they were here at St. Patrick's Church for their, the remainder of their lives. The building is very unique. It is one of the architectural landmarks of the city of Erie and the entire diocese of Erie. It's very unique in the fact that it is not a cruciform shape. Rather, it is a castle appearance. There is no steeple. It was castle-like to remind the people of the castles that they left in Ireland when they came to the United States. St. Patrick's began as an Irish parish, although the art that is in the building was acquired from German artisans. The main altar is 22 tons of solid marble and alabaster from the Boston Hall and Company. It has a strong fortress-like exterior gray granite which came from Maryland. The internal sight lines, there are no internal support pillars making it very unique. All of the structure is supported through a system in the attic of chains and beams. It also has a sloping forward floor, and this was done intentionally for viewing of the Stations of the Cross and the other beautiful art in the church. And it was uh, rather unique at the time and somewhat controversial because it was not in the shape of a cruciform. But this is what the Cauley Fathers wanted for their church. The church is Romanesque, the windows are half circle, and it takes us back to the time of King Ludwig I of Bavaria, the medieval times romanticism of the 19th century. The Franz Mayer Studio, the Royal Ecclesiastical Art Establishment in Munich, also in London and New York City, but the main headquarters in Munich, Germany, which they are still in operation today. They were the main suppliers for stained glass to the Holy See, especially Roman Catholic clients, um, and they were from the Vatican and Rome. The restoration in 2012 for the 175th anniversary cost $1.4 million. The stained glass was purposely installed to teach biblical stories. The Christ windows are on the west side of the church the Patrick windows are on the east side, and they are all in the clear story, and those windows are several stories high. The windows being in the clear story are because of the Stations of the Cross, which in fact the church was built around. The stations are seven-eighths life-size statues and reliefs, which we also have in the church, uh, several reliefs. They cost $600 back then to purchase, that the families that bought them Today, they are insured for $4.6 million. This is the third set, the superior set, I believe. They were found in 1893 at the Chicago Columbian Exposition at Grant and Jackson Park Midway. And Monsignor Peter Colley saw them and commissioned a set to be built for Erie. There is also an oil canvas behind the stations that display inside and outside the wall of Jerusalem, which makes it very unique. This is the only set in the world remaining that has a canvas backdrop. There were three sets. First set was destroyed during the war. The second set is in Pittsburgh, 
and the third set is in Erie, but the Erie set, I believe, is the most complete and especially uh, most refined and having the backdrops. Uh, we believe that the master artist carved the figures of Christ and the apprentices carved the other figures. There were, there's approximately five figures per station and the niches were built to prepare for the arrival of the stations when they were purchased and ordered in 1893 before installation. There are 14 stations of the cross, seven per side. The church has an oval dome which provides for superior acoustics. On Sunday, May 28, 1978, we suffered a tragic fire. It was Memorial Day weekend at St. Patrick's Church in Erie. It was electrical in nature. The dome collapsed and the church was closed for a whole year for reconstruction of the ceiling. There was damage. The pews had to be replaced with um, a rather modern pew. Uh, the windows, luckily there was not uh, damage to the windows or the stations, but the organ did suffer some damage. The church was used for the Erie Chamber Orchestra uh, concerts. We had a passion play for many years, and we also have had organ and choir recitals. After the church was restored, uh, the Conrad Schmidt Studio in Milwaukee, they were the company that we acquired to do the four-month restoration of the interior. Then the question was for the organ. It had been over 50 years that the organ had major work, and it, it needed to be attended to. And through the very generous gift of Morgan and Kathy Jaycox, I'm so pleased that we were able to restore our original pipe organ beginning in the year 2018 through a, a two-phase process through uh, Organ Supply Industries here in Erie and Heritage Pipe Organs in Buffalo. And it was my great wish and hope that we would use close by firms and companies to complete the work. And this organ will inspire congregants for the next hundred years and beyond. We had the final additions, two additions to the pipework to complete the organ tonally. I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Brian Tim from Organ Supply Industries in Erie, who will be discussing the amazing pipe organ here at St. Patrick's Church. Hello, I'm Brian Tim, and I am the Vice President of Organ Supply Industries, who had a small portion of what had to go on here with the reconstruction of uh, the Felgemacher organ, and worked closely with Mark and Monsignor on its historical preservation. One of the best secrets of Erie, Pennsylvania, is a small but critical manufacturing segment that has, has been devoted to musical instrument manufacturing. As we have explored the art and architecture of St. Patrick's Church here in Erie, one cannot pass up the opportunity to discuss art and manufacturing with A.B. Felgemacher's Opus 901 standing in the background. It was constructed in 1906, and it still presides over the music program here today. A more thorough history of the uh, region's musical industry has been compiled by Paul Fisher, uh, of the Fisher Pipe Organ Company in his published book, Making Music, The History of Organ and Piano in Organ Industries in Erie, Pennsylvania. Opus 901 is a fine example of Erie craftsmanship from the period. Every inch of the 6,300 cubic foot, 14,500 pound instrument has been handcrafted by local artisans, both from 1900 and from modern day. Each one of the 2,506 sound-producing, wind-blown pipes in this instrument each represent one handcrafted musical instrument capable of producing only one musical note each. They range in size from over 18 feet long and weigh over 300 pounds each, down to a quarter inch long, weighing only a few ounces. They are constructed from wood or hand cast from a lead and tin alloy, Upon completion of the construction of the pipe, each one is sculpted by a voicer who manipulates the wind sheet through each one to produce the desired musical results. These pipes are then grouped together by construction in sets of 61 or 32 to form one rank. A rank of pipes is a set of pipes that possess similar tonal characteristics across the compass of the keyboard. This organ currently contains 42 ranks. The mechanical chassis of the organ, casework, and console were all handcrafted 
engineered, and designed by local artisans to match the architecture of the church while providing the functionality demanded by the musicians. All in all, the instrument represents over 12,000 man hours of construction. The original contract price for this instrument in 1906 would have been between $5,500 and $6,300. The replacement value today for the instrument is in excess of $1.2 million. The importance of this, this instrument is that it has been recently reconstructed to serve for the next 100 years, for which the reconstruction cost of the instrument was a fraction of its replacement value. Known as the King of Instruments, for many reasons, it derives its nickname from the ability to mimic other sounds in the orchestra. The fact that such instruments, although each uniquely constructed to match their environment, utilize the entire building in which they are installed to help define their musical voice. Consider this um, as pianos. Most people know pianos. They come in the forms of uprights or grand, and each of those shapes help to determine the tone of the piano in this instance, the shape and size of St. Patrick's Church is what helps to serve and enhance and define the unique sound of this pipe organ. It's powered by a three horsepower electric blower for the wind supply, and a modern day switching of the organ is done through a solid state computer to allow multiple users and preferences at the console while still retaining all of its original sound producing elements. Not only a visual piece of art in the building, as a musical instrument, it allows a wide range of tonal color through the variation of the construction of the pipework housed within. Two major pipes of type construction can be seen in any organ. The first is flue pipes. They have no moving parts. And an easy example for their construction of a flue is, is, the, is in the uh, facade of this instrument, actually. Um, consider them, and it's a bad term, but it is like a big whistle. And in the facade of this instrument, um, it is flanked by the 16-foot principal and diapason on the grate. Although big and powerful, they're not as booming as one would think. Um, more commonly known is the 8-foot principal on the grate, which is the backbone of any instrument. The second type of pipe uh, construction in, in organ pipes is that of a reed pipe. That is a pipe that has a vast a vibrating brass tongue held in place against a shallot. The vibration of the tongue produces the pitch, which then is amplified through a resonator on top. These pipes mimic a more brass and reed sound of orchestral uh, instruments such as clarinets, oboes, trumpets, and tubas. Um, as a quick example, I will let you hear the tuba that is recently installed in this instrument. That gives you the, the reedy quality um, and some fire behind the instrument. Now, each keyboard, each keyboard on the organ, including the pedal board at my feet, controls a different section of the organ. As you look at the facade of this instrument, the middle keyboard is the grate and the backbone of the instrument, and it is located centrally in the case behind the facade. The lower keyboard is the choir manual, which has stops unto itself, and that is located to the organist's left in an enclosed division that can be made louder and softer by the use of the pedals at the feet. And then the top keyboard is the swell division, which is located to the right of the organist. The pedal division, which makes up a lot of the big bass low tones in the instrument, are sandwiched throughout the organ as space is made available. These can be used in conjunction or they can be used separately. And a quick little demonstration for you on different tonal colors in the organ. Let's do this. A principal tone. And a combination of sounds. or a lighter reed tone, an eight-foot clarinet.
The pedal board can also be used, aside from the low tones, I've picked an example here for you that will have a melody in the, in the pedal line, um, contrasted by a flute on the manual in the choir division. In that example, the pedal board was used for the solo, and there is an accompaniment on the grate which had a tune to itself. Now the center section above the keyboards houses the coupler rail, which allows the organist to combine keyboards together. So resources that can be found on the top manual that normally would not play below it can be used in conjunction. And they can be used in unison, super octaves, sub octaves, transposition. The tonal palette is represented by each of the draw knobs flat on each side of the keyboard stack. Each keyboard is assigned a name, the grate in this case, the swell is on top, the choir, and the pedal. Um, each one of those keyboards and its resources are, assign are uh, designated in the towers to the left and the right of the keyboards. The buttons under each keyboard represents the combination action of the organ, which the organist can use to set, set their own combinations of sounds that they choose to use and recall them on demand without having to have someone help them adjust for musical purposes. Um, those buttons are duplicated down at the toe level, so you can recall if your hands are busy, you can recall it with your feet. And to make a division louder or softer in the organ, each, each portion of the organ is enclosed in a big box and there are big louvers, I call them Venetian blinds for most people, that create the illusion that the sound is diminishing. That's controlled by the, by the pedals above the pedal board. We have expression. And then to conclude this brief tour of the organ, um, I basically want to charge through a hymn with you to see the registrational changes and combinations of the instrument in use. And again, I, I will urge the fact that all of this was in the sound producing portions was manufactured in over 100 years ago. Um, right here in Erie, Pennsylvania. It has had a few additions over the, in the past reconstruction, and it also had received a new mechanical chassis along with a new console. So I will play us out with an Advent hymn that uses the combinations just to show the tonal changes that one can go through. <laughs>